Good evening, everyone. Avid Learning, in association with Deccan Heritage Foundation and Picked Up Publishing, presents Gothic Bombay. Avid is a story of the passionate who believe continuous learning energizes us throughout life. Could we have the video, please? Learning is an SR initiative that fosters creative learning across the fields of literature, culture and heritage. Avid Learning is an SR initiative that fosters creative learning across the fields of literature, culture and heritage, art, visual performing and applied through various platforms that include workshops, lectures and panel discussions. Last year, we reached over 10,000 interested learners with over 100 unique workshops, lectures, and programs. This year began with sister cities, Mumbai, Karachi, and New York, an interesting discussion between H.M. Nakvi and Naresh Fernandez. We had a full-day workshop on decoding art deco, architecture, furniture, jewelry design, and its importance on Mumbai. At the Jaipur Literature Festival, Avid presented a panel, The Artist's Eye, with leading cultural theorist Homi Baba, discussing modern art with Glenn Lowry, the director of MoMA, Mark Quinn, and William Kentridge. Avid presented the Speakers Forum at the India Art Fair in Delhi, followed by a successful approaches to art management workshop with Australian faculty, Dr. Joe Cost. Next Thursday, Avid will be launching one of the great books written about an unforgettable metropolis, Calcutta by author Amit Chaudhary at Bangalow 8. March includes a partnership with Art Dubai and Focus Photo Festival. More information is available at our registration desk and on our Avid website. I would like to thank our venue partner, CSMVS Museum, and our media partner, Time Out, for their support. This evening, we will celebrate the relaunch of Christopher London's book, Bombay Gothic, with an illustrated lecture on the development of Bombay's Gothic buildings by Christopher, after which he will be joined by conservation architect Abha Narayan Lama in a discussion moderated by journalist and author Siddharth Bhatia on the city's ongoing conservation plan for specific precincts. The panelists will look at the various social and cultural influences as Indian architects began constructing Gothic-style buildings and also a look into the future, seeking to preserve and restore these iconic buildings which have helped create Mumbai's notable skyline. I would now request Shamina Talyar Khan, President of the Deccan Heritage Foundation, India, to say a few words, please. Thank you. William Murtagh, an American author who specialized in historic preservation once wrote, it has been said that, it's be that at its best, preservation engages the past in conversation with the present over a mutual concern for the future. As president of the Deccan Heritage Foundation in India, I have seriously thought about conservation and preservation. It occurred to me that each one of us approaches preservation and heritage in a uniquely different way. So much of it is dictated not just by our age and experience, but by our ancestry, our ability to prioritize beyond the basic, our sensitivity to art and culture, as well as our inclination to organize and actively protect that which we know to be important. 
Today in this room, we all realize how important it is to support an organization that is committed to preserving and supporting our heritage, and in particular, the heritage of the Deccan. It is a treasure trove of India, where architectural masterpieces of our Buddhist, Jain, Hindu, Indo-Islamic, Christian, Sikh, and Jewish past compete for ingenuity, creativity, and masterly execution. They are amongst the wonders of the world. This is a heritage that needs to be preserved as it will nurture the dialogue between the past, the present, and the future, and enable us to undergo transition without losing our cultural memory nor our identity. In a land where culture seems scattered about wherever a foot might tread, there has now come a time where action is required to ensure that this legacy will endure. The Deccan Heritage Foundation is both an Indian and a UK charity, and will soon have a US branch as well. Our goals are many, but we believe that in order to best serve this heritage is to start with the young. One of the Foundation's most ambitious goals is to create special educational programs that will enable the young to comprehend how important this heritage is to their lives, whether tangible or intangible. Our first educational program has already been launched in Bombay with great success, and we are about to start our first rural project in Hampi, where a generation will be educated about the history that surrounds them. These educational programs, which are being developed by our director in Bombay, Prachi Dalal, will go hand in hand with publications for a wider national and international public. Aside from our children's programs and publications, we would also like to sponsor the creation of a center to train restorers. Here, students will be instructed on methods of preservation and restoration and will enable them to take up projects for the restoration of monuments based on their historical importance and thus serve the communities in which they exist. I would like to thank our publisher Padmini Mirchandani of Pictor, who is also a trustee of the Indian Board, and our authors and sponsors, some of who are present here. Dr. George Michel, who is well known to all of you, unfortunately could not be here with us today. He has worked in the Deccan for more than 40 years, unraveling its history and its masterpieces. <coughs> Dr. Helen Filon specializes in the Sultanate architecture of the Deccan, where she has worked for the last 20 years. I would also like to thank Mr. Stefan bloch Salos, who is one of the fervent supporters of the foundation and one of the two sponsors of the magnificent book, Discovering the Deccan, which is also available for sale in the foyer today. I would like to thank Dr. Christopher London, who so generously offered to support the DHF with a reprint of his guidebook, Bombay Gothic. I hope that these projects will find supporters as we need your involvement and help. I look forward to hearing Abba Lamba, Christopher London, and Siddharth Bhatia talk about the richness that lies around us in Bombay and how this heritage can serve our communities, enrich our lives, and safeguard the multifarious identities that characterize this city. I have had the good fortune to be around beauty and craft for a good portion of my life. It has been my privilege to be a steward of that legacy, and it is clear to me that the DHF would like to involve us in this stewardship of a marvelous legacy, one that, would, one that would do well to nurture so that it may endure, and in doing so, allow us to have that discourse with the future that our past makes so rich and storied. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shamina. Um, can I please request Christopher London to come up and give his lecture, please? Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. 
and um, I'm very grateful to be asked to uh, give a presentation on my book. I hope you enjoy it, and um, please feel free to ask questions at the end about anything that you think we didn't cover or that you had a, a query about. Um, so, um, I just, you, you go down to slideshow. Yes, that's my first one. Great. Okay. And can we turn these lights off now? That'd be great. Um, I wanted everyone to imagine... How do I turn the volume? I'll just do that. Um, I wanted everyone to imagine um, in their mind, and so I'm starting with a poem, um, what it would have been like to consider um, Bombay in the 19th century when Gothic sort of comes to fruition. And so I started with a poem in 1847, and I thought it was a nice idea to sort of cast you back into that time when there are no buildings in this place and there are only the imagined dreams of it, which is how I see the city. So this is a poem by Edgar Allan Poe, Domain of Arnheim, and it says, Meantime, the whole paradise of Arnheim bursts upon the view. There is a gush of entrancing melody. There is an impressive sense of strange, sweet odor. There is a dreamlike intermingling to the eye of tall, slender eastern trees, bosky shrubberies, flocks of golden and crimson birds, lily-fringed lakes, meadows of violets, tulips, poppies, hyacinths, and tuberoses, long intertangled lines of silver streamlets, and upspringing confusedly from amid all a mass of semi-Gothic, semi-Saracenic architecture, sustaining itself as if by miracle in midair glittering in the red sunlight with a hundred orioles, minarets and pinnacles, and seeming the phantom handiwork conjointly of the sylphs, of the fairies, of the genie, and of the gnomes. I, I chose it partly also because it, takes, it was written in 1847, and the first church that changes Bombay significantly, the uh, Afghan Memorial Church, is designed in that day and at that time. And it's also the artistic imaginations of Europe that um, start to send their ideas to Bombay and change the appearance of the city at about this date and in the 1860s. So, and that's what this dream realizes in, by 1900. In fact, it's slightly earlier, but unchanged with modern additions. You can see how the Victorian skyline is very, very complete and very beautiful. And in the case of Bombay, it's also the largest concentration of high Victorian Gothic buildings in a mass in any city in the world today. Um, so if you start going back prior to that, um, you've got your fort, and this area is the, the Maidans, and this is where the water is. The next slide shows you a plan from 1864 with the direction reversed. So the port's behind the little boats, and this is um, Church Gate and St. Thomas Cathedral, and then this is the open land. So in 1862, they tore down the walls, and they were able to dream of a modern city, and they had the, the free space to do so. And so a, a, a list of public buildings was called for. And at the same time, 1861 to 1865, the Civil War was being fought in America, and the price of cotton uh, went up enormously in Bombay. You also had the railroad being built and opened in the same exact period. And then in 1869, the Suez Canal opens. So all sorts of material can be brought very rapidly, three weeks over three months, and you have all these people being invited to plan ideas. So this is the Churchgate Railway bringing the cotton down to the cotton area, and this is uh, VT Station and the, the Great Indian Peninsula Railway lines. And these are your public buildings. And really, almost all of them were built, and then they built more down here. So, and that's, again, an idea of the skyline taken from the high court. And you can see how the Maidans function, and you can see how magnificent the buildings are. And they line this great open space. And the space was developed for exercise, and it was by the sea as well. Now the sea is further away because of the 20s buildings. But at the time, it took advantage of the breezes and so on in a great setting. And then in the center of the city, you also had Stevens' masterpieces, um, 
the VT station and the municipal building and this great urban avenue with the tower of Crawford Market at the end. So at these terminal points of avenues, like great European cities, they built these magnificent structures to create a skyline. Um, but Gothic started in Bombay rather modestly in what I call a carpenter Gothic, which was a very simple buildings that came from pattern books. Pattern books were 18th century and 19th century uh, published books which architects could use to draw designs from. But uh, the British also developed an educational system for the architects that you have here now and the, and the craftsmen in the JJ school. So things changed very rapidly again in the 1860s. So you have these modest buildings, but they're using old-fashioned building materials as well, brick and infill and um, stucco fronting. Um, and so that they look rather different. This is a two-story affair, but again, you'll notice it doesn't have the arcade. It's just a flat structure with Gothic detailing put on, like a paper decoration cut out on top. But then in 1847 and continuing to 1865, Gigi Scott, who's a premier architect in Britain, is invited to make a design. Um, Salvin, another architect, is documented as having made a design for this church. And the, the world completely changes. It's made of stone, and the, the plans are much more elaborate. And well, here's Scott's church on the left with his tower, and then um, what happens when Coneybeard settles on the plan and they agree to pay for it is on the right. It's a bit more modest, windows and things like that change, but the, the idea is there. And then you get extraordinary interiors like you've never had in Bombay before. Williams Wales stained glass. The uh, metal worker for the JJ School does this iron work and all sorts of um, citizens start to pay to improve the city. Um, and so this church is to the Afghan memorial for the war, but it's paid for largely by Hindu uh, uh, businessmen, Jain businessmen, Parsi businessmen. It's not paid for by Christians, which I think is an interesting aspect of it. Um, that's the altar, and then there are the names of all the fallen and dead. But it's also a spectacular essay in Gothic style. If you haven't been to the church, I encourage you to go, go and see it someday. Um, another great designer who was invited to work at this period is Owen Jones, one of the premier designers in Britain at the time. And this building actually never got built in India, sadly. But it deals with issues that they had um, in the forefront of their brain for um, ventilation and how to deal with the heat and how to make buildings comfortable. So, it has this open space underneath. It was supposed to be erected at the Cooperage. And then it has this special second roof above it to allow it to be cool, because they wanted to figure out how to cool buildings off. And those are called thermo antidotes. That's a ground plan and then an interior view. But this building was built and is still, obviously, in Bombay today. It doesn't look exactly like this line drawing that was published. But uh, Roland Mason Ordish worked with Paxton and helped design and work out the structural issues and so on, and detailing of the Crystal Palace. So he was you know, absolutely preeminent um, in the field at the time. And this was the luxury hotel in Bombay of the date. And it's, um, it's very sad that it's neglected because its re revolutionary construction system produced the first multi-story residential iron framework building in the world. So, if you think of all the skyscrapers that have come on since and, the, and that design idea, its first um, evidence is actually this building in Bombay, which is, and it's completely uh, ignored by most people, but it's actually a very revolutionary object. And so these are all the designs. Again, in the 19th century, they were able to spread ideas very quickly because of the advent of the magazine. That's another important aspect. So I'm going to show you a group of designs that all got published because it's one of the things that went on. And these are some of the uh, column details that vary. But this building was completely preassembled um, and made, shipped out uh, through the Suez Canal the year it opened, and then arrived in Bombay and was put up in a span of about six months for Watson. So, and it was very handsome when it was first opened. This gives you an idea of how it looked, these sweet little tented pavilions. And these were open on all sides to get ventilation. And you could look at the hills from the distance and so on. It was a very a lovely building at the time. Another great um, architect in, in, in Britain, probably the most imaginative in the 19th century and perhaps one of the most eccentric. He worked for the Marquis of Butte, who was the world's richest man in the 19th century. 
and he did about five palaces for him. All of them are remarkable if you ever get a chance to go to Britain. Um, but here, he planned this museum of, uh, uh, this school of art, uh, which Jamsun Sijiji Boy, who was one of the leading businessmen, was going to pay for. It was very expensive, it wasn't built. Um, but they developed 129 drawings for it, and um, an architect named William Emerson brought those drawings to Bombay. So um, this is the back of, of the building showing um, some of the smithy areas and so on. It, it was a remarkable idea. So when Emerson got here, even though the school wasn't being built, he got on with the job and started to make churches. Um, and these are not with a very large budget, but they're very inventive designs. And they start to use all the local stone that's brought in by the railway, and they embrace local materials, which is also another special aspect of the architecture in Bombay and makes it different from Calcutta and, and Madras. So you have this wonderful stone, and in various colors, they identified all the stones um, and knew exactly which one to use. So I won't, I'll go through it quickly through, but um, William Burgess did this design for Constantinople. Again, it wasn't built, but it shows the same sort of detailing. And then I wanted to show you an Italian example um, from Pisa, which uses these sort of details and the same sort of doorway treatments that he has. And these materials were available to him through books by Ruskin and uh, like the Stones of Venice. And they also started publishing photographs of buildings in the 19th century. In the 1860s and the 1870s, they started making albums of all these things. So architects had access to that. They could, didn't have to go to all these places in Italy to see them. They could study them in their, uh, at their drafting table and draw ideas. And that's what happened in Bombay. So here's another great church by um, Emerson. It's muscular Gothic. It has these oversized, strange, quirky features, these frog details, strange columns. And then in Tide, it has really marvelous strange details like that. And the stained glass, is, which is located here, um, is um, by the maker who worked for Burgess. And he was, I would, I would say, the best stained glass, the most uh, refined stained glass maker in Britain in the middle of the 19th century. And so that, those are probably some of the nicest stained glass windows in the whole of India. It also has a full immersion um, baptismal font. So, I mean, this church is quite extraordinary to go and visit. <laughs> um, and then this is the third church that he did, again, this very strange muscular gothic detailing. Again, this, you know, all sorts of little details that are fun if you're going to see it. Another thing that Emerson works with from the Owen Jones is these thermo antidotes. They, they wanted to improve Bombay in terms of services. So Crawford Market represents this great leap forward for the quality of food and the presentation of food and the availability of it, the freshness of it. Um, the railway lines are directly behind um, the market, and it's laid out so that it's clearly distinct that the fish and meat are on one side, flowers and vegetables are on another side. It was able to be washed. The stone comes from Cape Ness, um, and it's ventilated, and it's also adorned with very beautiful features. And they put the clock tower at the corner to give you this great vista down the avenue from two sides, and he curves the corner to have it fit into the cityscapes really rather beautifully. Um, it also incorporates fine sculpture. If you think back to that Carpenter Gothic, it's very plain in comparison to the elaboration of these Gothic buildings. They're really much, much richer affairs. And Kipling came to, um, to Bombay to teach. Roger Kipling was his son, the famous novelist. Um, and these are all by Kipling. Um, and then inside this amazing cast iron work, this is a griffin with the, its um, wings here, and its tail coming around, and then it's biting the head of another creature. They also just started making gas lights, I think in 1866 in Bombay. Um, so this was, these were gas lights, and that was a kind of miraculous invention at the time. And then, again, these elegant rainwater heads. There are all sorts of fantastic features to this building. And the inside, they created a courtyard originally that animals could come in and the traders could um, rest and shade in that place. And this is the fountain that they developed for it. This is the design. And this is sort of how it looks today, although there's a metal shed over it, and they've knocked the top off. And it's rather harder to see than, um, than it is in this picture. Uh, but these are some details of, of river gods and uh, crocodile skin. Emerson's imagination was pretty fantastic. Um, 
Burgess, again his teacher, had this scheme, which you would have seen just before he left for Bombay. This is Sabrina Fountain in Gloucester. Gloucester, Sabrina is the Latin name for Severn, and so this is the fountain for the Severn River, which runs next to Gloucester. Um, another essay in this style is Rusi Metachauk, which I think was probably going to be put into the uh, main market. But um, Arthur Travis Crawford, who, oops, uh, who's commemorated here, had to leave under some sort of municipal scandal. And so I think maybe they decided it was better not to have him um, on this design, or they just decided to improve it and make a bigger fountain. Um, but in the next one, you can see that John Lockwood Kipling, the sculptor, is commemorated here with the sculptor's tools and his initials. And then William Emerson, W and E, here with the protractor paper and his drawing tools for his contribution. And another thing I was asked to do was to draw some comparisons. This is not in Bombay Gothic with European architecture. So I've taken the high court on the right and compared it to the uh, Cadoro on the left. Oh. Did it go off or? Sorry. Okay, can you hear now? No? You can't? I wonder why they can't hear. Use the what? Okay. So you take this thing off then? So I'm moving your uh, head so it's uh, not. Uh, okay, sorry. Amazing landscape of, of architecture of all different types of rising up to create this incredible Victorian style. It's quite, quite dramatic. Uh, and it really is like a dream that's been realized in stone. You had all this empty space, they were able to build one, two, three buildings, they all stand in compound. Again, in Europe, you might get a single building like this, but you wouldn't get a row and you wouldn't get them all set to walk all around them. So it's, it's Quite unique. Um, so the, uh, there's the secretary, this is the Scottish Church at the end, um, then Gigi Scott's design for the university, and then another a period photograph of it, and then inside these glorious stained glass windows um, with the zodiacs on the outside and months on the inside. Then you have a church post office. There are certain elements of all these buildings that are uh, characteristic as well. They, they settle on having these external corridors to keep the rain and the sun off the main uh, wall of the building. It keeps the building cooler and um, it, it creates this wonderful open massing as well. So it's a formula that's repeated over and over. Um, and then it's a PWD. Um, and then the last one is um, Stevens, it's the Royal Line Sales Home, same corridor idea all the way around. And I a very good sculpture here by Paul Bolton. Uh, and I'm going to do one more building sort of in detail. This is the Kaushikhanji building for the Elders of Cult. It's now a hospital. It's opposite from the Baradachi Bar Museum. It's just across the road. Um, I don't think most people notice it very much, sadly. Um, but it's a rather impressive building and Elders of Cult moved down to the fort. But, um, it, the feature that I'm particularly going to highlight is this one. Because the, the, another thing that Freyer did was he paid for the restoration of the Dome of Bijapur, and then he also paid uh, and sponsored T.C. Hope to publish three different photo albums of important sites in India, which people that had access to looking at and could study. A Bijapur, a Dharm, or Mysore. So, so I may have gotten this later wrong, but anyway, that's the idea. So that's another photograph of it being fully realized. And this is the source, this is the Metabahal in Bijapur, and this detail here is picked up. It's either from photographs or from visit, because they also went to many of these places to see that Bijapur is very popular with British architects. In fact, British architects got um, Islamic architecture.
first and better and more easily than they did Hindu. I don't think it's a slight on anything, it's just they seem to understand its formalism in the 19th century better uh, without the textbooks to guide them along that we now have. So, again, fantastic metamorph and this wonderful detail. Um, then this amazing muscular gothic structure of the high school, uh, which if you haven't been and walked up too closely, it's amazing the very fine metalwork, amazing quirky turrets, and paid for by a wealthy Jewish businessman in the city. And then his design, his watercolor is out of this period, this is 1878. And so Stevens got this proposal, he had to sell it, and he used his great watercolors to make the proposal. Uh, you know, come to life and build. Uh, it's really quite a fantastic drawing. Um, and then I wanted to just analyze slightly this building. So, uh, Stevens uh, got a boat, went to uh, London to study after uh, he got the commission um, and on the lead up to it, I guess. I'm not sure which, but anyway, he, um, he went to study all these uh, train stations. So, you have this long sh shed here, and you've got the long shed here. You've got this amazing entrance court and step down which entryway, you've got a traffic flow issue and you've got a clock tower at this end. And then if you look at VT, you've got the entrance court. He had to accommodate an office. This has a hotel and then an office, so it has slightly different uses. But, um, and he also had to build three facades that were formal, this one on this side with all this incredible courtyard. But you get, you get the same idea and then here's his clock tower. Um, and then these are just details of bits of ET because it's such an extraordinary building. And the dome was built without centering, which is also an extraordinary uh, achievement at the time um, with these dungeons. It's a bold thing to do, and it's crowned by progress. And then this detail relates quite well to the next shot, which is uh, Notre Dame. And it's just, in, in the 19th century, Notre Dame was restored by the Elaine Duke, and, and they were published over a magazine articles about it, so, so I mean, it was something that would be very much available to people, that enthusiasm for these kinds of quirky sculptures, because um, this is quite an extraordinary thing, uh, show up in, in BT. You get, oop, you get a monkey um, chasing a rat, and then you get these amazing sculptures. And then you also have this same programmatic relief decoration. So it's really extraordinary to have the peacock of India, he ends, and then uh, Britain and India at the entrance. Um, so that's the dream that um, is been realized so successfully by these um, extraordinary architects of the, the coming together of um, so many influences um, at one time in the 19th century. So I hope you enjoyed that. Please have a very nice lama and star pajya on our stage, please. To introduce our panelists, Abhay Narayan Lama is a conservation architect based in Mumbai. Her architectural practice covers a range of projects across India, from an ancient Ajanta Caves to 15th century temples in Ladakh and Hampi, and palace museums in Hyderabad and Gwalia. She has won eight UNESCO awards for conservation and is the recipient of the Sanskriti Award, An Shah Fellowship, and Charles Wallace Fellowship. Abha's practice is based in Mumbai and covers a range of Victorian buildings across India. 
She serves in the Mumbai Heritage Conservation Committee and the Executive Committee of the Urban Design Research Institute. Siddharth Bhatia has been a journalist for over three decades. He was part of the founding editorial team of DNA in 2005 and managed its opinion pages till 2009. He is now a regular commentator on current affairs for Indian newspapers and on television. He has, said, he has given several talks on politics, urban affairs, popular culture and media and all things Mumbai. His book Cinema Modern was published by HarperCollins in 2010. And now over to Siddharth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everyone can hear it at the back. Good God, I never thought uh, when we were discussing this that there would be such an audience. And uh, it's a tribute to what people, uh, uh, how much people care about uh, their city. And uh, of course, our speakers. Uh, I've always felt when I look around uh, Bombay's uh, of Gothic buildings <coughs> that it's a case of hiding in plain sight. We pass by uh, these buildings every day. Uh, millions of people go in and out of uh, BT station, the municipal corporation, the profit market. Uh, we perhaps spend about a half a second noticing some of these vignettes, some of these wonderful things. I think uh, if you open the book, you'll see even more wonderful things. Uh, but how much do we actually relate to them? Uh, Christopher has given us a little bit of history. I'm going to take this forward a bit. Abba will then talk to us about what is being done to preserve and conserve some of these buildings. They are in quite bad shape, some of them, uh, after they are 50 odd years old. And how, I think more importantly, how the city must relate to these wonderful architectural wonders that we have in this great city of ours. So Christopher, uh, you didn't talk about it too much, but it's there in your book, Martin Flair, the governor in the 1860s, I think, took a very important decision to demolish the uh, fort. And then he decided that he would open up all that land to uh, let buildings come. Along with that, he had a personal vision uh, and his own personal preference for parking, which by then was not particularly involved because there were other conflicting styles also. I've often wondered, was this also a case of the empire making a statement? Do you think, was this an imperial statement also of some kind, or was it just the convenience of building these massive structures? I, I, I think that, I don't see it as an imperial statement. I think that, I, I see Gothic architecture in Bombay as the modern style of architecture at the time in which the issue of building these buildings needed to take place. Um, you know, the British Empire was growing at a colossal rate. Bombay had become a significant city. It had wealth, it had a great location for trading. It had now this great railroad that could bring goods to this great port, which was the, one of the great deep ports, the only was the deepest port in India. And they needed to have a government that functioned, and they needed to have universities to train people to do things, and they needed a court system, and they needed... So prayer, was a convinced god. He absolutely loathed 18th century architecture because he did a, a two volume uh, memoirs in which he recounts his disgust for 18th century squares in London. It's quite amusing <laughs> to read. So, and he said that our forefathers left nothing of any distinction behind them and things like that. So it's quite pointed. Um, and he wanted to make Bombay the first city in India. He proclaimed that when he wasn't yet governor in the 1840s, so he had an architectural dream, he had an aesthetic preference, and I, I see the buildings as the realization of that um, compulsion that he had to, um, to, to build something lasting. Now, as an empire builder, it was maybe a personal ego thing as well, because he went on to build in other places, and he went on to administer in other cities. Um, but that, that's how I see it. I don't see it in that other way. I see it as an aesthetic, choice and uh, as a way of a great legacy. The British wanted to be great legacies. Uh, one of the interesting things I think that comes from your book and also a bit in your presentation was that the engineering and the design of the British, the workmanship is Indian. Uh, a lot of whimsical Indian designs have been woven into some of the buildings. 
uh, VT station, for example, has all kinds of small uh, carvings by the students of JJ School of Art. Uh, you see Indian uh, styles in it. But also there was Indian money involved, wasn't there? I mean, that's a very interesting thing because this public-private partnership of that time, the Indians were actually participating in the mercantile and commercial activity of the Raj. Yes, they, in fact, especially in Bombay, uh, the idea of giving back is you know, very uh, substantially realized in the structures. If you go and look at the various buildings and you read the accounts, you can see that the major donors were not British, they were Indian donors, the uh, Jews, the Jains, the Hindus, the Muslims, they all gave, Parsis gave a lot of money to establish these institutions. They wanted to improve their city um, and make it a better place, and they did, um, considerably so. So it's, it's really quite an admirable uh, conjoining of forces. And then the JJ School of Art allowed um, people to be trained properly to do that. And then there are also Indian architects that I didn't uh, talk about in this 30 minute window I had, but um, who, who are involved directly in education. And then the, the, the JJ School of Art has a school of architecture and so on. So they, they realized what the need was and they filled the need. Um, and the British did see themselves in a way like the Romans. They wanted to go around and leave. Um, city, city patterns, city architecture um, as a kind of legacy for themselves. They saw themselves as another kind of empire in that sense. And maybe that's highly like egotistical of them, but it's also, we're very lucky that they did it because they left quite good plans and they left quite admirable buildings behind. So, and I don't know if anybody else would have bothered, so. Um, how does Bombay's logic uh, compare with, let's say, Calcutta's or Madras? Uh, Madras was a presidency, and in Calcutta you see the magnificent Victorian structure. But how does the Gothic compare to these two? Well, the, 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 there were three presidency cities. You know, Bombay was the Western presidency, uh, Calcutta was the uh, Bengal presidency, yeah. and then um, the Madras was just called Madras presidency. Yeah. yeah. So um, in Madras there are almost no Gothic buildings to speak of. Um, Indus House Senate is greatly preferred. Chisholm was the leading architect and practitioner, and so it, it just didn't take off. In Calcutta, um, there is the, the cathedral, um, there is the high court, and there really aren't any other extraordinary buildings in Calcutta that just kind of revolutionized. Victoria Memorial came a bit later. Yes, much later. And it's by the same architect who did all these buildings in Bombay, it's by William Anderson. Uh, but a neoclassical building was called for because Calcutta identified itself with the 18th century palaces and they wanted a great building of that type. It's, you know, it's a fantastic Edwardian building. He was president of the Royal Institute of British Architects. So, um, but it isn't Gothic. I mean, that style had lost its popularity and um, people didn't look for it in the same way that they did in the middle and later part of the 19th century in Bombay in particular. So how do you think you've been coming to India for years now, um, you've studied this, how do you think the citizens of Bombay, of Mumbai now, react to these buildings? Uh, most of these buildings are institutional, uh, most of these buildings are institutional, you can't enter them. I think you mentioned that there, are, there were some residential buildings which are now almost gone. Uh, how do you think, I mean, I'm going to ask about this question too, but as a visitor, how do you say? I found when I was working. Relate to it, rather, more more. I, I do think people relate to it because the elaboration of the building, in a way, looks somewhat like Hindu architecture, so they can be attracted to the sculpture, even if they don't exactly understand what it's all doing and what it's all about. Um, I think the physical uh, development of the building uh, is a sympathetic one, and I think that's another reason why it's a popular choice. Um, and I did find when I was studying the buildings, people were curious to know what I was doing and why was I taking these pictures far out, you know, what, what was I up to kind of thing. And then I'd say, oh, I really like them. And, and then they would say, oh, well, they are rather nice and, and they wanted to know more. So I didn't find that people thought that they were rubbish and that they should be knocked down tomorrow or anything like that. And mostly people expressed an interest in seeing them cleaned up and, and restored. Um, but as time has gone on, people are more divorced from the buildings, which I think is very sad. Um, 
And in other cities, people are actively working to get the public to embrace the architecture. And I would hope that Mumbai would do that in the future. Um, allow people to have access, give people guides, uh, guidebooks or audio guides, or um, I talked with you about an open day. Um, in, in London, in New York, and now throughout uh, Europe, there are, uh, there's a program called Open House, and although it started off with a few buildings in London, maybe 60 to 100, it now embraces something like 3,000, and it's over a weekend. And you can get into properties that you wouldn't normally have access to, and you can sign up for things where they want to limit it, but it's really quite a fantastic thing because it gets people to be engaged in their city. And you can do it in your neighborhood, or you can travel around and go to the great buildings that you always wanted to see in five other boroughs or so on. And the same thing in New York. Um, and it, it's very, very, very popular now. So um, the only building you can now get into very recently is a BT. Um, but you can't get into the municipal building, which I think is crazy since everybody pays taxes for it. Um, and it's, it's their building. Because when I wanted to get in, it's very difficult. Um, and I think that you should be able to get into all these buildings that you support, and also that are really lovely, and that you don't get to enjoy because you're, you know, you're met at the gate by a guard, usually a compound walking, not even at the front door. So. This is actually a perfect clue for uh, Abba to come in. Abba, you've been involved very closely in uh, uh, listing buildings, conservation. You've seen these buildings from a very unique perspective. You've probably seen some of the disrepair. Uh, how do you think uh, the city must uh, engage with these buildings? And more importantly, what are, the, what are the efforts that the Heritage Committee or yourself put in to make sure that these buildings last? I think the one distinction that um, I would like to make for Bombay versus a city like Calcutta or Delhi, which were also colonial cities, is unlike Calcutta or Delhi, which was an act of political will and it was a, you know, something that they decided is the capital city, <coughs> so the government was willing to pump in money and, and build all the structures. Bombay encapsulates the spirit of, of private enterprise and what makes the city of Bombay and all these great buildings are the fact that Premchand Loichan was willing to give 6 lakh rupees to build the Rajabai Tower and Kaushi Jahangir gave money to build the Convocation Hall or Elphinstone College. Jamshed Ji 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 paid for the hospital and uh, uh, the School of Art. So all the buildings of Bombay, the grand structures that we so proudly use, are really not given to us by the powers that be. They were built by the sweat and tears of the people of Bombay and funded by by the merchant princes or really the corporate part of corporate society. It's unfortunate that really corporate social responsibility is now not focused so much on the historic buildings and the heritage of Bombay, but still we have, in the last 20 years, we've got more conservation happening in Bombay compared to other parts of the country. Purely, you know, because we're waiting for that government grant to come through. So, you know, the Kalakura Association raised funds 11 years ago, and we managed just to raise 5 lakh rupees and we managed to restore the facade of Elphinstone College. So, even with little money, one could, or the brave babies of Oval, as I call them, you know, fought the government and got the Oval by gun cleaned up. So, we've had amazing, you know, cases of, of initiative. But also, the fact is that compared to other cities where you see heritage as this, you know, monument as we fenced off and like a museum piece, you see it from a distance. In Bombay, we have a very intimate relationship with our historic buildings. I mean, most nine out of ten cases, you'd be either born in a historic, in a heritage building, I mean, J.J. Hospital or Grant Medical College, you'd go to school, which would happen to be a Victorian building, it's J.B. Bettet or, you know, any of the schools. Your college might be a historic building, Xavier's, Elphinstone. Uh, if, you, if you fought a court case, you hand up in presence of Manchester's <laughs> court, my court. Uh, old secretariat, when your file is stuck in your birth records and run to the municipal corporation, you'll catch a train through either Bangra Station or VT every day. So we have such an intimate relationship with our Victorian buildings. Unfortunately, we have such an intimate relationship that we spit on them and we do other <laughs> unmentionable things on them as well. But the fact remains that this, the citizen of the city is constantly engaged with the historic buildings and I think that's why conserving <laughs> Victorian buildings is not really a luxury and why people think of it
with this being, you know, oh, heritage is sort of a base. It's something that you can indulge in. It's not an indulgence for us in Bombay. It's just our very basic existence, our quality of life depends on a large, uh, you know, a, a, a fraction is dependent on, on the, the environment. And for most of us, if we're going to office or school or court or library, uh, these are the buildings that we live in. Is actually a very interesting way of uh, looking at it. But what is even more interesting, I mean, when you began, you started talking about uh, you know, corporate funding, private income, <laughs> merchant princes funding, and all that. The other interesting thing which I compared from then onwards is uh, periodically in Bombay's history of the last 150 years, a lot of land gets suddenly available. So, Freire knocked on the fourth wall, and you suddenly had these maidans and these open land, and then reclamation happened in the 20s and then Art Deco came up. And now we've seen what's happened uh, in BKC, in the Prel and all that. <coughs> the difference, as you say, and that's something I think, Christopher, you could also comment on, the difference is that after that happens, whether we should build for the sake of building or whether we should say, let's build new, but also somewhere take along the old. You know, I feel that, yes, it's important to build new, uh, but the fact is that uh, in the last 50 years, if you had to name five buildings that you liked architecturally in Bombay, I mean, all of us would be struggling, but if you say name five buildings from you know, the 19th century, and you'd have to, you have to really worry about which one you're going to knock off to make your top five list. So the fact remains that our planners and architects have done a shabby job, I'm sorry to say, in, in the last 50 years. Why not just recycle the great buildings we have and adaptive views and just recycling is actually the greenest thing. Having said that, it's also the fact that when, we, when, when they were planning, when you look at, we look at the fort walls we demolished and this whole is the name opening up for construction, you have Chuck Shaw who was monitoring the design of every building and even a grand architect for the design of Watson's, Watson's Hotel, the design was was turned down, I think, three times by the by the Chop Shaw Commission because they didn't find it gothic enough. So there were checks and balances. I mean, I wish we could have something like that, like a, an urban arts commission or something, even to decide for new buildings whether they make the cut or not. I I have done that sort of work in New York for 15 years, um, so I. Uh, the co-chair of the committee that looks at every application. Freya knocked on the fourth wall and you suddenly had these maidans and these open land. And then reclamation happened in the 20s and then Art Deco came up. And now we've seen what's happened uh, in BKC, in uh, Prel and all that. <coughs> the difference, as you say, and that's something I think this way you could also comment on, the difference is that after that happens, whether we should build for the sake of building or whether we should say let's build new but also somewhere take along the old. You know, I feel that yes, it's important to build new, uh, but the fact is that uh, in the last 50 years, if you had to name five buildings that you liked architecturally in Bombay, I mean, all of us would be struggling. But if you say name five buildings from you know, the 19th century, and you, you have to you have to really worry about which one you're going to knock off to make your top five list. So the fact remains that our planners and architects have done a shabby job. I'm sorry to say, in, in the last 50 years. So why not just recycle the great buildings we have and adaptive views and just recycling is actually the greenest thing. Having said that, it's also the fact that when we, when, when they were planning, when you look at we look at the fort walls being demolished and this whole is the name up for construction, you had Chuck Shaw who was monitoring the design of every building and even a grand architect for the design of Watson's, Watson's Hotel, the design was, was turned down I think three times by the, by the Chuck Shaw Commission because they didn't find it gothic enough. So there were checks and balances. I mean, I wish we could have something like that, like a, an urban arts commission or something, even to decide for new buildings whether they make the cut or not. I, I have done that sort of work in New York for 15 years. Um, so I, uh, I'm the co-chair of a committee that looks at every application 
um, to the Landmarks Preservation Commission. The Landmarks Preservation Commission is the uh, civic body, uh, the chair is appointed by the mayor, uh, to oversee all the properties that are either historic districts or individual landmarks. Individual landmarks are sort of the highest thing, I suppose you call them a grade one star list of buildings or something like that. Um, and all of those buildings need change all the time because constantly change tenants and use and so on and demand time. So they have to file an application with the commission and then what's different, I think, than in Bombay is that there is a public process that you go through and people can come in and comment. So uh, people in the neighborhood who don't like that developer and think his project's hideous and too tall and has ugly windows and is the wrong color and terrible brickwork or something, they can come in and complain by making a, a, a statement at the hearing. And then there's a group of people called commissioners and they review these projects. So, and there are also standards um, which if you conform to specific rules of restoration, you don't have to go to the commission. So, because there are many, 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 many projects. But you only see 40 or 60 items um, by monthly, so every, every uh, two weeks. So um, that, re you know, that reduces the amount of topics that come up for a conversation. So that's, that kind of thing, if you did it here, would be fantastic. You'd have a conservation area, and then if you play by the rules, you don't have to be regulated in any particular way, you just do it with staff. But if you want to do something that challenges that, then you open yourself up for public comment and public review. And but, they, uh, then they can change the designs as well. I think uh, if the uh, public was invited to vote or give their opinions on the aesthetics of any building here, very few buildings would be made, I can show you. Uh, what exactly are the challenges you are facing vis a -vis the conservation of some of these buildings? And let's stick to Bombay for the moment, especially some of the more prominent buildings. What are the exact challenges in terms of um, architecture, in terms of uh, foundation, money, all that? Uh, regulations? The, the, the challenges vary. I mean, for example, we were working on the surveillance plot building of a uh, convocation hall. One of the greatest challenges was that you had tube lights everywhere and uh, you know you had wiring everywhere and that's because the building was originally gas lit and how would one you know so so one of the greatest challenges is to be able to get the the, the authentic information to be able to restore well. And while there are original drawings of some buildings, uh, surprisingly uh, G.G. Scott being the kind of architect he was, even uh, the Royal Institute Architects or the British Library didn't have those drawings. So a lot of times, uh, those were the ones uh, that were sent here. Yes, yes. Uh, so sometimes there are just records that go missing. Uh, the challenges at other points are just uh, a lot of times uh, either a kind of an apathy in terms of the powers that be or a lack of resources. Uh, which you know, but, but that's that's something that I think is a surmountable challenge. So whether you go you know, for, for various models, I think. At the JJ School of Art, there was this issue of funding for the restoration, but then uh, we managed to, uh, the friends of JJ, uh, sorry, though she is one of the people who was involved with that board, uh, they managed an amazing uh, idea of having a Ravi Shankar concert, have people auction and raise about 18 lakhs in one night, got a member of parliament to, uh, to match that. So I think Bombay has actually explored one of the, you know, really novel ideas of being able to raise funds for buildings. So I don't think that really should ought to be a challenge. But yes, there are huge challenges like developmental pressures and the kind of things like cluster redevelopment policies and all which sort of give a blind check to the builder. So you if you're a building in a historic precinct, even in the fourth precinct, you actually are only allowed to consume your 1.33 or whatever FSI if you stick to the rules. But if you actually demolish it and you're getting four or five uh, incentives. So in a sense the the planning systems in the last few years have actually toppled so badly towards the builder that they are actually incentivizing people to knock down buildings, unlisted buildings or grade 3 buildings within historic estates. I mean, we have a huge controversy of Crawford Market, which is one of the finest buildings in the city, you know, William Emerson, and had it been anywhere in the world. And uh, a builder did have an idea of building a structure and uh, when at that point we had you know gone to the heritage committee to say don't do this uh, the members said we're really not sure if the whole market should be grade one or just the front building and one of the, the then municipal commissioners said 
people go to Crawford Market to buy vegetables, not to look at the architecture. So, <laughs> I'm the so it's also challenges like this. Well, but that's where uh, I think again the question arises: you bring in the citizen and give the citizen a stake, at least in terms of the idea and what you were suggesting about open uh, uh, weekends, etc. So I said they need they need to be mutually exclusive. You could do both at once. Uh, so, bring in the citizens and all that. But I think awareness is growing. And I think the point you raised earlier about it being seen as an elitist activity also is slightly growing. As I see it, just as a leader, as a citizen, is that uh, the committee itself sometimes finds it difficult to keep moving forward, etc. By which time, more buildings will get demolished by the time they're notified and all that. Those are those bureaucratic aspects take their own time to uh, move forward, don't they? I wouldn't want to speak on behalf of the committee wearing a heritage committee hat. I think okay, I was just trying to put you in a corner. But uh, no, actually this is a misnomer. You know, the, a, a lot of people are worried thinking that the buildings that have been put up on the website, the new listing can get demolished. But under a High Court ruling, even a draft notification is supposed to be considered there and present and to be taken cognizance of unless otherwise proven. So actually all the buildings that were listed, I mean last July, uh, have to come through the heritage review process. But it's, uh, no, no, it's also uh, frightening when you go to Marine Drive and you suddenly see on E Road or B Road or somewhere, there's a building being demolished and there's this awful structure coming up and that's going to spoil that entire architecture facade. But uh, that person or that builder seems to be getting away with it. It is because of the cluster redevelopment policy. So half the cases don't even come to the Heritage Committee because... Uh, the same would happen to DM Road. Completely. I mean, all the, not DM Road because fortunately it's 2A, but every other Bora Bazaar and every other building that's unfortunately 3 in the 4th precinct. And now I think Baby Bazaar also there's a little bit of a... Yeah. So are you optimistic? Are you optimistic about us preserving the logic and well, the I think I'm a diehard optimist and I think we'd like, I'd like to share with all of you that uh, for many years, in 2003, I made a presentation to UNESCO about declaring Bombay's Victorian Gothic heritage and its art deco as being the only case, only city in the world which has this amazing dialogue of two centuries. So if you take Oval Maidan, you have on the east this fabulous streetscape that that uh, uh, we just saw of Victorian buildings and across the, the oval is this, across a century, is this fabulous ensemble of art deco. And it's been a long uh, journey that UDRI, we, we, we tried to convince various chief ministers who came and went. And finally last year we got uh, the present chief minister to sign a, a letter to the government of India forwarding this as in Maharashtra's official entry to the World Heritage List. Now every year the government of India can only send one cultural site. We made it to the tentative list last year, which is a queue of you know uh, lists, uh, buildings that a city or a country wants ought to be on their list. So we at UDRI we're working frenetically towards submitting a dossier this year, battling uh, the for resources. And, uh, but if we make it this year, then hopefully it will make it to India's official entry to UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. And I, I, I hope uh, we get you to, to at least go through some of our statements of outstanding universal value and pictures. We'd like to do that. <laughs> Again, uh, but the same question to you. Are you optimistic uh, that uh, we we'll continue to have this? <laughs> when I first came to Bombay, the buildings weren't listed at all. I, I watched the process of, of listing and at the worry that uh, developers had that they weren't going to be able to survive and so on and so forth. And then the constant conversation about FSI, which covers every conversation in India, <laughs> Bombay at least. But um, I am optimistic because the buildings are still here. They're very well made and they are restorable. And I think that the, the next process is educating people and um, about their qualities so that they actually enjoy them and they take an interest in them. Once you have a lot of people interested in something like that, then they will get fixed up. So, um, and, I mean, and they'll still be here to do that. So, um, you won't find all the original drawings, I don't think, anymore, sadly. But, um, but the buildings leave enough there for you to work from anyway. You can guess from, from the other examples and other places to go to, to proceed. So, 
And they'll be fantastic when they're mixed up, I can tell you that. <laughs> By a happy coincidence, the original drawings of uh, BT Station by Stephens are on display at JJ's Book Park. Uh, last week, uh, a couple of days left, last week I went and saw them. And again, by a very happy coincidence, just recently, about a month ago, uh, BT has opened its doors to the public. Uh, every day in the afternoon, you can go. JJ School students take you around. They're very enthusiastic, they're very knowledgeable. And you go and see all these little things uh, which were close to us so far because the offices were shut. And you can go and see how every detail uh, was uh, drawn by the architects themselves. And inside, the, outside uh, on the main uh, gate, you will see the names and faces of the first board of directors, uh, and Jagannath Sakkarsen and Jamshit Jiji Boy are two of them. So it's uh, a well worth a visit. Tomorrow's the last day, so. <laughs> For the exhibition. Yeah, and the drawings, the drawings are simply amazing because you can see every detail which then got translated in stone. Uh, and I suspect uh, uh, that uh, the artisans put in a little bit of whimsical, uh, their own, uh, yeah. And then there are a lot of these kind of thighs, uh, tongue in cheek kind of pieces uh, along with the dark ones. So that's. Uh, Anything else, uh, Christopher? Uh, a message to Bombay people. You've written this book, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, we hope uh, you know there will be more, uh, perhaps a bigger one. But anything that uh, you're a friend of. <laughs> okay, so we'll open up the questions. I think we have 15 minutes. Anybody, please uh, identify yourself and ask a question. Uh, where are the mics? Yeah. But where are the mics? Somebody back right there. So, just one second. One second. I would encourage people to go to the JJ School and see the show, because it really gives you an idea of the imagination and the effort that it took to, to create these buildings. The, the, the drawings are very, very beautiful. The working drawings for metal work as well as uh, woodwork designs and stone carving. I think it's still part of this article that fleshed out in the drawings because people would love to do what they want to, unless they decide about size and depth and so on and freeze. But, um, and, and it's probably the last day. But it, they were also very elegant, just as objects. They're beautifully colored and they evoke a time when architecture was very different than what it is today when everything's drawn on the computer. Um, and I just, I just think that people would enjoy seeing them. Bonus, the bonus there are also gorgeous photographs, uh, really gorgeous photographs of the person taking the seat here. Um, and so they help you understand exactly what happened with the drawings. So I, I think the correlating them in your mind and seeing them is a, it's a, a very refreshing and enjoyable experience. It should be this. The bonus is, of course, that it's in JJ, which is another classic building to go and see. Yeah, please go ahead. You would ask a question. Good evening, sirs and madam. Congratulations for speaking so well. Madam, why don't we have cowdled ceramic line as recycled material, ceramic, and for creative designing, military wood for absorbing water? And since ACs are used a lot on the terraces, every four inches, the plot of the pot of plant, put a hole in the morning, put the water in the night, it will be totally cool. And why don't for pollution, why don't we have me? Tulsi and Kadulim uh, hanging from the building, so all pollution will be absorbed. And Madam, why don't we teach the young in the schools and colleges, repository and repository centers, all this restoration in the park, so they all take care. Thank you. Sorry, I think he wants to know why uh, these methods are not being used for. Uh, what you're talking about is largely, uh, you're talking about. Making those, these buildings eco friendly, if I understand your question right. Um, it's absolutely important to make buildings eco friendly, and that's why things like rain water harvesting, even the Prince of Wales Museum has a fabulous rainwater harvesting system. And most of these buildings were designed in a way that they actually didn't even need air conditioning if the cross ventilation was so fabulous. Uh, but uh, that's something that's actually integral to a lot of the the construction and design of most of these older buildings and they are actually far better in terms of their passive solar uh, you know, 
uh, design. So uh, they, they're definitely far more green and far more eco-friendly than, than most new buildings. So digging into the earth, but, 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 but we, we can, excuse me, excuse me, no, no, excuse me. Yeah, excuse me, there are others to ask questions. You can have a discussion later. Sorry, who got to ask a question? Yeah, please. I am Santos, I am a short filmmaker and I really enjoyed this presentation and when you see these buildings, you know, Skalagara building, all the buildings like, it is a dream sequence, you know, like a fairy tale. And you know, over by the, the other side, it's all the buildings, the same architectural language and all these buildings like in 50 colleges and home university, the same language in terms of architecture. But all of a sudden, when you see this Dalla Street building and ESNL, these two buildings, the architect language of these two buildings you know, doesn't go with this Gothic architecture. If these two buildings are like a giant entered into the fairy tale to spoil people's charm. <laughs> so, if I suggest, will you agree that these two buildings, GSM building and this Dalar Shishok and Sin Tower, this will be relocated. Now, <laughs> It should be relocated without something possible to do. Will you agree with that? Because you know, sir, if you start a signature campaign, I think everybody in this room will sign. It doesn't matter how much money you are investing to preserve this building, but unless you relocate, no, it's not going to. Yeah, maybe relocation, first demolition, then relocation. Yeah, my name is Sumit. I just wanted to, uh, the, as in uh, Mr. Krishnapur said that uh, uh, at some point in time the Gothic movement uh, uh, lost uh, its sheen or something of that sort. So, uh, when did it, that actually percolate down to India and uh, uh, the uh, counterpart in uh, say Great Britain as in uh, when did the whole Gothic movement uh, lose its momentum? Uh, well, Gothic, Gothic in, uh, in Britain came very slightly earlier, I suppose, um, than in Bombay with like Dean Woodward's project in, for the Natural History Museum and so on. Um, but in any case, it, it started to change about 1890, and you've got. Um, an impatience with Gothic, it was perceived to be um, a sort of dark um, and old fashioned style. And um, with plate glass windows, uh, flow glass windows, and all sorts of other innovations that people could have to make facades more open. And then uh, there was a popularity for plain stone, so Britain, uh, Portland stone began to be used uh, more frequently in buildings. So you, you got the Duardian style. Which doesn't really start until Edward and Queen Victoria is still alive, but um, you do see it uh, moving away from the highly trained Gothic. Also, it was too expensive to carve buildings up in the way that you have here. Um, and then there was a, a great battle um, when the municipal building was being built uh, as to what style it's going to be. And um, Indusat Senek was um, given the first chance, in fact, and Stevens was kind of away, he, he missed it. And he was livid because uh, Rob Fellows Chisholm, who was the premier architect of Madras, um, was being given this job and it was directly opposite his, his ET. So um, he went round all the commissioners who he knew very well. It's Grata Geary, who was the municipal commissioner at the time, he built his private bungalow and so on. So he lobbied them very actively and he won. And uh, Chisholm didn't get to build the project, and Stevens did. So, um, it, even, in, even in India, it was beginning to lose its mojo, I suppose, um, as, as we approached 1900. Um, and by then, it was seen to be old fashioned, and everybody moved on to a new style. So. Uh, the building we are sitting in, museum, is the tapering in last bits of Gothic, isn't it? With a, some of the Saracenic influences. Actually, this building was designed by Winnet to be for that. Um, and I found the original drawing for it. Um, but then, um, again, it was deemed that it would be Indian enough, it wasn't uh, appropriate, because once you didn't have one style that everybody wanted, which was Gothic, then the field was open for choice. So, you know, that's confusing. <laughs>
<laughs> and people had a fight about what Bobby should have next. So um, then they thought that in the South Central it was going to work better because that's what other large cities were doing and it appealed. And it had a national character um, and that I think became more important. Politics changed in India. So that was the style that was developed and used for the structure. So. Yes. Uh, Mike here, please, in the front row. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is, in a sense, what the buildings we're talking about in Bombay are new Gothic buildings. Because when you really talk about Gothic architecture, you're talking about medieval buildings. So my question is simply, why do we call these buildings Gothic? I understand that it's in the same style. But technically, would it be right to call them neo-Gothic or Gothic? Technically, neo-Gothic, yes. Just like um, neo-classic.
beyond FSI of 4 and 5, you need not have a natural ventilation for toilets. You don't even need to connect your sewage into the municipal lines. So it's really everything that was meant for slum redevelopment. And you don't need to, even if you're a grade 3 listed building or within a heritage precinct, you don't need to take heritage permissions, which is a very frightening thing. So 70% of Kotaji Wale assessed buildings and can go into cluster redevelopment. Half of South Bombay as we know it can be completely erased in the next five years. And uh, we are facing this. Uh, you can, you know, all of Marine Drive can go. Uh, Mahalakshmi, Kotaji Wale, Devi, all the things which are the image centers of the city, Banganga, also happen to be high real estate values. So, Builders are only looking at it in terms of FSI is equal to multiplication and, and basically just money. And uh, when you have a battle of, you know, which is so unequal, uh, definitely heritage is going to lose out. You know, on the subject of Bengi Bazaar, I might add a little bit. Uh, that's a, turned out to be a very unique kind of situation because there, there are, you know, a, a lot of deaf people around there belong to a certain community. Uh, they are ready to go along with community leaders who say that they can give you better uh, uh, living conditions. Some of those buildings are in really, really bad shape. People, families of four or five, who may be otherwise well off, uh, are living in about 150, 200 square feet. Um, they, they don't have toilets and the buildings are about to collapse. Now that uh, is a very, very major incentive for anybody who is living in that situation to get a free flat ownership. On the other side is the unique character of the area. To give you an example, it's simply Chor Bazaar, for example. I mean, going to book Chor Bazaar in a mall, it's just not going to have the same, uh, the same uh, flavor, the same impact. Those people are entrepreneurs. Uh, there's a lot of commercial activity going on. Uh, Start of something which is absolutely fabulous. Um, anyone who goes there for a walk is struck by what those people thought <coughs> uh, and uh, when they were building about 100 years ago. So it's that balance. Meanwhile, as uh, Abba just pointed out, there's a policy in place which is leaning in the direction of the developer, unmindful of existing laws. So that's the balance. And if you have the people there who can go along with it, then it's going to be a really tough battle to say we're going to part of it. Incidentally, they also are aware that the aesthetics will disappear. But what is the aesthetics when you are looking at it? I mean, a voting, the vote bank of the, the tenants will always be more 
involved in the board panels in terms uh, of the owners and that's why rent control policies won't, I don't see them changing either. Uh, so, and rather than the government actually put uh, money in or capital investment in improving the lot of the city, then sort of uh, distances itself from that responsibility. In, but, but the problem is that this kind of a policy gives it, it's a free for all for the builders, and that's where the problem lies that you can't completely devolve yourself from, as, as the government from the planning of these clusters. So, nobody's <laughs> denying these issues. But, one has to look at streetscaping, the skyline, how drastically it's going to completely transform the city is what needs to be studied at least at the plan, at the drawing board, which unfortunately is not even happening uh, uh, you know, on our planning end. Hello, I, I, yeah, I have a question. There's one last question. Yeah, can I ask a question, please? Sorry, there was somebody here before. Uh, I, I guess the person left. My question is a little more fundamental and uh, we can take this at the same piece of the work of my work that we had today. Well, could you stand up? We can't uh, see you. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, my name is Mr. Khan. I'm, I'm a writer and a journalist. And my question is more fundamental to us in this presentation. And uh, I don't want to sound as a topic topist, but uh, my question is fundamental. Uh, and I question the very title of the presentation, the coffee, coffee, or coffee, coffee. And my question is basically, is there fundamental uh, any uh, premise to this notion that there existed a certain indigenous component of this uh, Gothic style as you find in say the French Gothic or the German Gothic that the speech styles in and of themselves. Uh, what you see here, we may call it pure Gothic with traces of uh, say analyst style uh, that evolved in, in uh, modern song. With Oro Billy and other than Art Tenko and Rococo. And so it's a kind of a combination of those developments that you see in the late uh, 19th century. Uh, and my question could then be uh, to kind of ponder as to why perhaps this uh, kind of constructive dialogue did not occur in India between an existing indigenous style that you see going back to Bajra or Harappa, shall we say. Uh, and Given the fact that there is a 2,000 year old history, the, the monuments, the monumental town planning that you see in Dhola, uh, much of the Indus Valley uh, settlements. Uh, Sorry, I I am coming to a specific technical presentation of in terms of giving the historical overview of why there was no evolution of a, a style of a Gothic style in India. Which, it, which it could have a foundation for two thousand years old of foundations to build on, uh, given the fact that there was an indigenous style of architecture here going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what might be the historical reasons for that? And also, also, also the policy that uh, there was a public private partnership uh, that we have heard about, given the fact. And can I answer? This was just a local gentry that had grown fat on the opium trade, uh, the economy that you mentioned. And so, uh, by no means they represented the population at large. Thank you. So, in sum, was there an Indian Gothic? Is that the question? <laughs> so to answer the first question, there is an Indian All of, all of that's true, but I don't think that it makes the buildings any less attractive or any less valid as architectural forms. So uh, you could you could you could recreate the same. I don't really want to have a long-winded dialogue with you. I'm just trying to answer your questions. So, so let me let me try and answer your questions in sequence, so, sir. I got your questions. Let me try and answer them. Uh, if you won't allow him to answer, then you ask him. Could you please let him complete his answer? So, in the, in the case of the Gothic buildings, they do look particularly Indian in that there was a study of the natural plants 
and also there's a use of the Indian stone and Indian sculptors. So if you were to give them to um, an architectural historian in Europe who was trained in looking at Gothic architecture in Britain or neo-Gothic architecture in Britain, they would know right away that it was from India. So they have a very distinctive character, they use distinctive architectural language, and they look as if they come from this place. So that was your first question. Um, Oh, and they were also they were also people. You were talking about looking at Hindu forms and going back to uh, Hindu forms. And yes, there was a, a British theorist named F. S. Grouse who um, is a very interesting architect, and he did a whole group of, of projects that exactly do what you're talking about. And he advocated for them in articles, and he spoke about them, and he he was quite successful in that sense. But he didn't he wasn't taken up, and he didn't become hugely popular. Uh, Maroon Tarantour wrote an article about him and his work, and he's, um, he is well known. So, um, so yes, there was a controversy about it, and so you're correct in your observation about it. But, but, the, but the mainstream builders didn't didn't grab it, and the mainstream funders didn't grab it. So, last one, last question, please. Anybody? No. Yeah, please. Everybody interacts with, and yet nobody notices. 
and it's only through education and through publications that the greatest awareness will be created to be able to make this heritage more available, more comprehensible, more um, closer to the people who live around it. And it's not just Bombay, it's the whole of the Deccan. And each region of the Deccan has its own architectural tradition, which is equally interesting, terribly varied, and always innovative. Um, so I would like to thank um, the director of the museum for allowing and for offering this uh, wonderful um, evening tonight where uh, we were able to listen to Christopher and this wonderful discussion. Thank you, Mr. Mukherjee. I would like to also thank um, uh, Ruhi, uh, Madhu Ruya and Asad Raji from the Avid for their wonderful cooperation and for um, helping to make this program uh, possible. And we look forward to many more such uh, evenings where uh, we can see that some more progress has been done in preserving these monuments. And uh, I'm sure that ABBA will be one of the movers and shakers in this respect. Thank you.